Seriously, is this like a... The lighting is weird here. This is starting to look like this is like a PNG, a uh, transparent PNG that I've just superimposed. This is legitimately here. I just don't know why this switch is doing such an incredible job of reflecting off of my frankly very cheap table. Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today we're returning to the subject of bloody cheap switches. This is the Sedola 24 port, uh, 2.5 GBE and 10 GBE network switch. We've got a couple of SFP 10G ports there and 24, each of those are 2.5 GBE. No mixture of 1Gs or anything like that. Knocking around for about 320 to 330 nicker. Uh, the price tag on that does vary in a few places, but just looking at Amazon in the UK and the US, again, it sits around that 330 mark, give or take. Now, that amount of money for a 24 port switch, there are some users that are going to hear that immediately and go, that seems expensive, or they're going to hear that and go, that seems super cheap. Now, why is that? Nice and simple. Network switches, when you reach this scale, it stops being simply a case of how many ports and what the ports do. It actually diversifies quite largely. Two great examples that I looked at research in this video, uh, one from uh, a Unify switch, a Unify Pro Max 24, that is listed as a 24 port, 2.5 GBE switch, but only eight of those ports are 2.5 GBE. There's a couple of 10 Gs, but the rest of them are one gig. Likewise, when you look at Netgear with their incredibly diverse portfolio of solutions, you can find everything from 24 port, 2.5 G, 1 G, and 10 G switches as well. But the problem is, the minute you dig down more and more, that price for at least Netgear as it is goes crazy. Now, why do those price tags go nuts? One, they could be layer three switches. More on that later on. What is going on with that seagull? But then there's other factors such as power over ethernet adaptability there. And bandwidth management internally. Now, all of those things do tend to bump up the price, but it's when you examine things in those little modular fashion of this add-on, this add-on, this add-on, that you suddenly realize that that 330 nicker price tag, it is a good price, but once you break it down into the modular parts of what you're getting for your money, it's actually not too cheap a price either. It's actually kind of somewhere in the middle. We've seen lots of cheap switches on the market, and I will say, again, and we'll touch on this later on, if you watched uh, that uh, 4 plus 2 review that we did a couple of weeks ago on the Sodolo small one there, you'll know the software, although managed, is b -b -b basic. But more on that later on. Now, this switch here, uh, it's fanless. I will say that as well. When you reach switches at this scale, I think a lot of first-time uh, mid-tier, even larger tier businesses, when they get a switch to manage, you know, multiple terminals in a single office environment, they massively always overlook fan noise. I hate seagulls. Switches, when they reach this scale, have a tendency to make quite a racket because when you've got that amount of bandwidth management all happening at the same time, the result is that you, the fans inside just have to keep those transistors, have to keep those individual heatings and the network controllers cool. So a lot of even eight port 10G highly managed switches, if they're all 10G on their own, tend to arrive with fan systems and those fan systems are consistent fans. They're not fan systems that are just there when they need them. Those fans are constant. And I think a lot of users tend to overlook that fact. So the fact this is silent, although that does bring into question temperature during operation, I will say that at the very least, it means this is not going to inhibit when it's what you're working around it, be it, you know, a content creator sense or just general day-to-day -day PC utilization. But we do have to look at the implications of a switch that doesn't have a fan when you reach this much switching capacity. Rated at 120 gigabits internal switching management inside there, we've got all of those individual uh, controllers there with their heat sinks. There is no active airflow running through this system. It is purely passive. And I do think that is a concern on a 24 port system. It's great that it's low noise. And if you're not going to completely, you know, hammer this thing all the time, because this is still 2.5G, it isn't exclusively 10, you'll probably be okay. But I had this device running with 10 individual mixed 1G, 2.5G, and 10G devices running into this for the better space of 48 hours. And 
this thing got warm. Yes, there is an argument that, you know, during constant hammering, it's going to get warm, and therefore there is the downtime, the idle time to dissipate a lot of that heat. But not having an active airflow through this is not great for everyone. I kind of would have wished that there was a fan internally and perhaps even a physical switch and not be overly reliant on the software triggering it. In terms of power consumption, they rate that this device at maximum potential power use because they're using one of those open uh, PSU plans there. They say it hits 36 watts max use. Now with those 10 mixed devices that we had connected to this, we hit about 17.1 17 to 17.2 watts. And that was with each of those ports being utilized on AJI time after time. It wasn't a constant hit of individual small data. It was large blocky sequential, but nonetheless, it was a switch that you know was transferring that data well, but definitely temperature concerns me. Now, had you deployed this in a rack mount cabinet, maybe in a server room with plenty of active ambient cooling, a lot of those points were probably going to be utterly nullified. This can be deployed in a rack, uh, rack mount capacity. They arrive with the rack mount handles either side. And returning to those uh, SFP 10G ports there, I'll say straight away, we went ahead and installed two of the Sedola SFP to RJ45 adapters and connected this uh, to a 10GBE NAS and a 10GBE client device. Worked fine, but these got very, very hot. And even Sedola themselves do not recommend utilizing this switch with multiple of these for long periods of time. So again, fair play to them for at least telling us and being honest about it. But point about power consumption and heat ever so slightly aside, I do think users that are looking at this as a quick fix solution to suddenly add a barrel load of connections to their existing home or business environment need to at least go in with some realistic expectations. Now, this is an, a layer two switch. It is effectively a switch that allows you to run pretty much the standard processes, link aggregation, virtual LANs, uh, priority of service and quality of service control. Uh, you can switch up to 16K jumbo frames there in the background. Again, port mirroring, you know, uh, loop detection, that kind of stuff. All of those are based in there as well as identifiers for those MAC addresses there, which is pretty much part and parcel of a layer two switch. Now, a lot of users who will make direct comparisons, myself included there at the beginning, as a reason we highlighted it, between this and what we considered layer three switches, which add that additional layer of identifiers utilizing uh, network IPs, not just utilization on the MAC identifiers. Um, those extra features, if you need those, if you need to run a very bespoke network across multiple floors of your building or separate subgroups and you need those VLANs to communicate successfully or you're gonna be bridging multiple switches together, this isn't gonna be great for you. That layer two level of management internally is gonna hold you back. And I think that's a very, very important point if you're looking at a switch like this to replace or upgrade an existing a port switch in your local network environment if you're going to be going big. Don't just assume that 24 ports means you're going to be absolutely laughing. A lot of it's going to come down to that software. Now, going to that software, that's the other thing we really do have to talk about because as mentioned in that previous 4 Plus 2 review, this software is supremely Billy Basic. I do not believe that Sedola um, build it themselves. We've seen numerous uh, budget switches coming out of the likes of AliExpress and more utilizing this same software with an insert logo here graphic. Again, so I'm not, you know, having a go at them for that because they are utilizing a third party OS clearly that's being rebadged and reused all over the shop there. But do not expect miracles from this software. It will not blow you away. It will frustrate you at times. There is not a lot of guidance in all the individual options. And indeed, a lot of the graphics can often be not comparable to the solution itself. But if you're using everything at default and you're just going to be relying on the general standard of security and management afforded to you know, a, a budget switch with realistic expectations about what you are getting for your money, this does stand out because it will give you that nice defined basic level. And I defy you to find a 24 port 2.5G and a couple of 10G port switch that gives you a similar level of control and management at that price tag. Again, as mentioned in the intro, if you pull back on features or add features, such as scale back on the 2.5 GBE and maybe scale up some PoE ports, scale up to a layer three configuration there, or scale back on some of these and go for an eight port 2.5 G and a four times 10 GBE, there's ways to play with that price. But again, it comes down to which of those elements 
you need the most. And if you are looking for just a shockingly large number of 2.5G ports there to facilitate numerous NAS devices and utilizing, as mentioned before, 2.5... I really need to put this in a better place. Utilizing 2.5G or even 5G adapters, this will stand out. And for 300 Nikka, there's a lot of future proofing there. But just keep in mind, this is a mid to low tier switch wearing a big boy's coat. So don't think that this necessarily translates to a ubiquity, to a net gear. This is not comparable to those. But there you go. We're going to be making direct comparisons in a follow-up video between this and a Netgear Layer 3 Pro Switch, talking about things like lifetime guarantees and warranties and what that actually means, and also talking about those noise levels, but also temperatures across the two when they're dealing with the same packets of data to give us a realistic expectation about what we get and what we don't in affordable switches there. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this as a written review, hopefully live very, very soon. I've run NAS Compared. There's also links to where you can get a hold of this switch if you are interested in getting a hold of it. And if you were going to get it and if you were going to go to those shops anyway please use those links it really helps us out thank you so much for watching and apart from that have yourselves a bloody great week